shift away from prioritizing the needs and desires of the adults in society and move towards what is in the best interests of children. Um, she's also a faculty advisor to the law school Civil Rights Law Journal and the Latino uh, Law Students uh, Association. She consults for the Pontifical Council um, of the Laity of Vatican City. She's an advisor to the U.S. Council of Catholic Bishops here in Washington. And she's a founder of a wonderful um, organization with a wonderful website called womenspeakforthemselves.com. Um, again, I highly encourage you to go and have a look. Um, I, am, I have a friend in Germany um, that, I, that is studying uh, bioethics, and she's about 12 years younger than myself. And on Facebook the other day, I've been <coughs> friends with her for a long time, don't see her very often, but she posted, reposted something from Women Speak for Themselves onto my Facebook page. <laughs> and she and I had no idea that she was both following this, this thing. And so it was actually in Germany right now, so it was absolutely wonderful. And um, she's also a, a consultant for um, ABC News. Um, another very impressive uh, thing is the global presence that Professor Alvarez has. She's not an isolationist. She uh, has uh, been very involved um, as a permanent, as part of the permanent observer mission of the Holy See to the United <coughs> Nations uh, concerning women and the family. Um, prior to joining the faculty at George Mason, she represented the USCPB before legislative bodies, academic audiences, and the media. And she was also a litigation attorney um, in Philadelphia at, at the law firm for a while. And um, I would say that she wisely left, but I know she's got some attorneys in the room. <laughs> and seeing that I'm married to one, I have a I should say that. Um, <laughs> fascinating, I found this online. I hope it's okay that she was a spot welder and a diner waitress in yes. Philadelphia. <laughs> Thank you for that thorough and sweet introduction. I'm going to tell the audio people that this little thing keeps popping out. So if you notice it pops out, it just keeps just falling. And I'm half Cuban, so I talk like this. Yep, there it goes. <laughs> so um, it may give you trouble. It just isn't uh, fitting in. I'll do my best, but um, I'm not sure I can contain my hands not to touch it. So uh, I I'm really honored that you came out this evening. Um, I know there's a lot to do in Washington. Um, my own kids are out at various talks <laughs> tonight. Um, uh, oh, perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you very much. Excellent. So, um, so I'm honored that the school invited me and that you are giving me your, your little time that I'm sure you, you don't have. <laughs> um, I'm delighted to be here on the Feast of St. Paul. I have a child I named Paul, strictly for the purpose of the conversion story. <laughs> and um, so it's a big day for me. <laughs> it's my favorite 
very mouthy, very bold Saint Day, and I'm, I'm honored to be speaking on it. Um, you may have noticed if you looked at the title of this presentation that it should really be a book reading, <laughs> not a lecture. I mean, the title is, is really overwhelming. Um, because the body of law dealing with and responding to the fact of their being in society, male and female, is huge. Even today, when a lot of people are claiming there is no such thing as a person's sex, that everything is socially constructed gender, even in this era, we have laws specifically relying on the existence of male and female. They deal with things like assigning a child's legal parentage, bases for non-discrimination in hiring, housing, et cetera. We have to know if there's a male or a female. Sex matters in immigration laws. It matters in laws concerning abortion and contraception. I could go on. Not only is the subject huge, but it's potentially far too predictable. And I really don't like being boring. You know, I could just rehash things you've heard snippets of or more. This rehash would take you through US legal history. And it would note the following. And here I'm about to give you what you thought the topic was and then tell you it's not. But just in case anybody would be disappointed. What you might think I would be dealing with, and is of some interest, is how the law used to treat men and women distinctly differently, largely on the grounds of women's asserted inferior rationality, intelligence, and other capacities, and on the grounds of claimed religious or natural rules about women's submission to men. In this part of the presentation, you would hear about things like women's earlier inability to own property, to vote, to keep or manage their earnings, to obtain an education or a job, to get custody of their kids at marital dissolution. My students are always really surprised to learn that childbearing manuals were written for men, you know, up through like, the beginning of the 20th century on the theory that they were ordained to lead the family and raise the children and women really couldn't form them. You would also hear about women's inability to see their husbands for rape on the legal fiction of their complete unity. So there was no one or in the immortal words of Sir William Blackstone in his commentaries on the law, which did form a very important basis for American law. At law, the husband and the wife are one, and the husband is that one. Okay, I'm done with my Blackstone impersonation. <laughs> I would then segue into the period of the mid-19th to 20th century when gradually the law changed. Wives were permitted to own and manage their property. And here we want to give a little shout out to Western rancher women who got it all started because their husbands were away and they needed to own and manage their property. Women were allowed to serve on juries and to vote. During this period when for a time women were put up on a pedestal as paragons of virtue and maternity with some good intentions combined with intentions to get them out of the action, women became even the preferred custodian of children of tender years in the event of a marital dissolution. Eventually, federal and state laws put women and men on something like an equal footing with respect to the dealings with the state and with third parties like creditors, employers, educational institutions, landlords, public accommodations. But regarding their private lives, women were left substantively really in an inferior position vis-a-vis -vis their spouses who with their continued rights and, uh, and abilities to earn money with their continued elevated social position and their control over the family money and family decisions like education, health care, etc., men were still able privately to control the economic and social fates of women. Penultimately, I would be telling you about the laws entering into a so-called private realm of, of marital and family life. It eventually comes in and it begins to adjust the public and private, or excuse me, the private relations of men and women in their relationship with very mixed results. So in the 1990s, even nonviolent husbands were forbidden to be uh, given a notification by their wife. The law could not say husbands had to be notified if their wife was going to abort their common child. Even with uh, uh, caveats in the law that this was only if it was their child, if the husband had never been violent, or if the husband would not become violent even the first time upon learning about it. I worked with Governor Casey in those days in the 80s to help write this law. We had really big provisos. Even then, men were deemed too violent to know um, whether their child was going to be aborted. 
There was also at this same time uh, when the government was stepping in to uh, manage male-female relations, the giving of uh, the right to access contraception and abortion, but in terms that the law defined these as the central legal rights securing women's freedom and equality. At the same time, the country began to take domestic violence between a man and a woman legally seriously. Also, many states entered into the relationship by maybe allowing couples to have prenuptial agreements, but limits on just how they were worried about men taking advantage of their fiancés vis-a-vis prenups regarding uh, distribution of property or money at divorce. And in some states, under some conditions, the law was changed so that women could sue their husbands for rape. Then finally, I would have brought you up to the minute and alongside the continuing existence of laws recognizing that male and female are facts prior to culture and law, there are a growing number of laws denying the same and saying that what is male or female is a matter of subjective judgment or cultural norms. But that in any event, the current position is that the law should strive to recognize absolutely no distinctions between men and women. All interesting, maybe even to non-lawyers, all may be helpful for grasping by distinction how we think of men and women today, but frankly, all done. It's all been done before. It's done in landmark legal textbooks. Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote one of the very first textbooks on women in the law. Mary Jo Frug's landmark textbook on women in the law. It's done in law review articles at least once a week. It's done regularly in popular media more than once a week, done a thousand times and now 1,001 if you count my criminally brief summary of, <laughs> of like 200 years of history. So I thought I would offer you something new, while well, not disappointing people who expected that. Not just for the sake of being new, but because I'm tired, and I suspect many of you are too, of thinking about men versus women. Men over women, women over men. I'm even tired of the same or different debate. Not because any of these things are unimportant or uninteresting, but because I actually think we have a bigger dilemma uh, in law, also culture, but I'm here to talk mostly about the law. It is not about men and women individually, but it's about men and women in relationship. So under the title tonight, I did my speaker's license here, and under this topic, I decided to look at the law and where we stand respecting the legal treatment of the union between male and female at law in particular in the marriage context. I think the answer will surprise you. Consider the following. Probably most of us are aware of the decline of dating and marriage, especially among poor and minority Americans. We're aware of the delay in marriage, of the rise in cohabitation. Cohabitation, right? By definition, an agreement to live in the same residence, to have a sexual relationship, but to refuse to commit one's person or future to another. We're horrified by the data on porn use. Every time I think I've heard what I need to hear, I stumble across another expert at a conference and I'm, I'm newly blown away. We're depressed at the unbearable lightness of sex. And we're not the least bit surprised at the horrid stew of male abuse of power, confusion and ignorance concerning sexual etiquette, let alone morality, and the complexity of the whole notion of consent, which has brought us to this Me Too, Time's Up moment. So I think it's safe to say that the male-female relationship is having its troubles. Of course, we know this is not everyone, and there's plenty of mutually loving and supporting couples. We know that. But at the same time, we are experiencing some historic lows, as I've just described. Now, you would think that with this in view, and with every politician and judge imaginable having at least once in their political or judicial lives uttered the statement, quote, Marriage is the bedrock of society, unquote. You know? You would think that lawmakers would respond to the current weaknesses of male-female relations with some action, significant even, to shore up men and women insofar as the law has resources and jurisdiction to do it. But they haven't. And I propose to you that it can be argued that they have actually moved in the opposite direction. So this is what I want to discuss with you. This is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to give you some examples which will give you a flavor of what I mean. But then I'm going to explain why logic, intuition, data, 
would support the laws caring about male-female relationships, even in the current environment. Then I'm going to tell you why my arguments are losing badly, even as these arguments, um, even as I should say the, the positions that are being taken in opposition to my arguments are really based on lousy anthropology, flawed data, and flawed ethics. Then I'll speak very briefly, because you know the answer to this, as to why this matters to Christians, and think about a few things legally to assist. First, I'll review a few examples of particularly the federal governments working to weak male-female relations. There's lots of state analogs to this, but I had to you know, stop talking sometime. Now, now, some of these examples, particularly when I speak of the executive branch, where Obama administration policy that has or will likely disappear, at the, uh, specifically at the um, Health and Human Services Agency. But we have every reason to suspect that these policies will return in a future administration. Is there a president who believes that equality, freedom, compassion, and happiness requires robustly embracing a notion that autonomy regarding consensual sex of any kind is of paramount importance to the human person, is in fact the source of their identity, is going to come back into the White House? Okay. I also take important examples from the Supreme Court in constitutional decisions that last a long time. So Congresses come and go, White Houses come and go, but these decisions last. And so no matter what happens politically, these are going to be with us. And they are supreme to all federal, legislature, all federal legislation, to all state constitutions, and to all state legislation. So they're crucial. So to begin my examples, especially the judicial and executive branches, which is interesting, right? The ones that are not quite as representative of the government, have from time to time cast suspicion upon men in particular and the possibility of harmonious relations between men and women. Looking at the Obama White House, they sometimes helpfully convened conferences and lent rhetorical support to issues affecting women that were good and displayed uh, tendencies to just, you know, go women, go girls. But they also displayed more a tendency to emphasize divisions between the sexes. And they never actually spotlighted the good of cooperation and mutual support between men and women. If you looked at the website of the White House Council on Women and Girls, you may remember that. I think Valerie Barrett ran it at the White House. If you looked at HHS, if you looked at the Department of Justice, the Department of Labor, the EEOC, they referred constantly to executive interventions about the following subjects. Domestic violence, violence against indigenous women, unequal pay, rape, sex assault on campuses, sex assault in the military, breaking down barriers, a claimed higher cost of women's health care, the glass ceiling, women's underrepresentation in STEM jobs, the differences between the sexes' retirement readiness, and cultural changes that would give women the respect they deserve. That is just the list. I didn't skip anything. There's no ellipsis there. That's everything they dealt with. Think about the pattern of conflict that that that, that it gives to, to your mind. Executive agencies all under the Obama administration also turned their back on working towards stable male-female relationships by treating men and women's relationships as fleeting physical experiences, unlinked to family, future, kin, marriage, children, and even love. They did it on their uh, information pages on hhs.gov, um, and they did it a lot in their partnerships with Planned Parenthood and the National Campaign to Prevent Teen and Unplanned Pregnancy, which has recently changed its name to Power to Decide. <laughs> Just as an aside here, if you looked at National Campaign to Prevent Teen and Unplanned Pregnancy, their acronym spelled Knocked Up. And since they were, <laughs> since they were an, they were basically a contraception all the time group. That was kind of an odd. I, I actually think maybe they finally caught on with that, and so they've just changed their name to Power to Decide. In any event, because of the amount of money the Feds gave to Knocked Up and to Planned Parenthood, like hundreds of millions of dollars annually, um, at the Department of Health and Human Services regularly featured their materials on their website, and when they had resources. 
So um, just as an example, I don't have extensive quotations, which are in my new book um, that um, Suzanne was talking about. But let me just tell you some of the examples here. So HHS fact sheets for women highlighted the good of consensual sex constantly. They never used the word marital. They did not talk about sex in the context of any long-term horizon. Referring to childbearing, they highlighted women's choice as to timing, but never childbearing within marriage or the good of children being reared with their mother and father. They noted this on the teen page. No, you know, teen pregnancies, they said, were a problem, but never to the 20 and over. It was also uh, in some of the references to Planned Parenthood, if you looked at the pages of Planned Parenthood and Knocked Up that they referred to, um, these are the kinds of things you could read that HHS was referring you to. Planned Parenthood's Understanding Sexual Activity Information page stated that sex includes, quote, a wide range of behaviors and is an important way to connect with ourselves and other people. On the subject of pregnancy, they opined, no matter if you're married, partner, or single, you have a lot to think about if you're considering getting pregnant and having a child. Only you can decide when the time is right for you. Raising a child can be exciting and challenging. One of the benefits of single parenting is that you do not have to compromise your values and beliefs with a partner. Nice. On HHS's website, womenshealth.gov, under the Obama administration, they recommended Knocked Up's Bedsider program which was an online birth control support, which they claim has 10 million readers. There was a marvelous article written by um, uh, Meg McDonald years ago um, that I refer to in the book and here, um, who works with me at Women Speak for Themselves and I Believe in Love. And Meg chronicled Bedsider, and here's some of the things that she pointed out that I also um, went and looked at myself. It has a Frisky Friday series, for example, that offers recipes for aphrodisiac food or heating up your weekend with our best sex tips. Um, it offers consolations for girls depressed about non-relationship sex. That's a new term you see in the sociological literature. It's sex with someone before you've had a date, before you know them. Um, quote, some of the most modern, empowered, secure, sexalicious women among us have had at least one walk of shame. Knocked Up offered e-cards and graphics, including invitations for casual sex, photos of natural objects resembling female and male genitalia, bondage equipment, and other soft porn. These were the postcards that they have for you to print and give to, to the opposite sex. It's about us, us section, touts a woman's right to a happy, healthy sex life without worrying about an unplanned pregnancy. And it offers members a booty log app for your phone that encourages anonymous sharings of your sexcapades. A Frisky Friday blog urged readers to cohabit and have non-marital births with the following advice. Being unmarried doesn't mean no babies and no carpools. Create the life you want. You don't have to do anything but the stuff that pays the rent and makes you happy. If you want to have kids, there's a way to do that. And if you, don't want to sh if you want to shack up without the formality of marriage, go for it. Just don't ever feel bad about your choice. If it's right for you, it's right. This is, the f this is what the feds were recommending for the public. Okay, and funding, and states, lots of states, funding this as well. The bottom line messages are these. Sexual enjoyment is extremely important to human happiness, identity, and female power. It has nothing to do with relationships even, building them, let alone marriage. Choosing what you want is also very important, but stable relationships are not important for the government at all. Turning to the Supreme Court, one of the Supreme Court's most important and revealing statements about the relationships between men and women was in the Casey decision. As some of you may remember Casey, it was, I think, 1992. Yeah, Webster was 89, Casey was 92. And it was a decision about Pennsylvania's law on abortion, which, which tried to respond to the Webster decision's invitation to maybe pass a few more regulations respecting the life of the unborn. Uh, there was a provision in there, which I've referred to earlier, that uh, said that a woman had to notify her husband if it was his child, if there had never been violence, and if she really believed um, that he wouldn't be violent or someone else wouldn't be violent to her when she revealed that she was going for the abortion. The Supreme Court did the following. They took a, a data point called intimate partner violence. You know this data? Intimate partner violence throws together violence between married uh, um, um, couples, single, ex-married, dating, ex-dating, cohabiting, and ex-cohabiting. 
and it throws it all together. And the Supreme Court said, this is proof that married men are violent. They took all of that, and we know that violence outside of marriage, and I've seen all kinds of figures, is anywhere from three to eight times higher than it is in marriage. They laid all that intimate partner violence on the shoulder of the husband and said, the odds of him beating his wife are so high that we can't imagine any woman can really say that she's safe. And this was Ruth Bader Ginsburg's um, uh, her conclusion in the Casey decision. It painted a very dark picture of marriage even, of men, of the relations between men and women. Obergefell, of course, is really the most definitive statement, the same-sex marriage opinion, by the federal government about the unimportance of the male-female relation. Now, there are many ways of describing Obergefell, but if you really think about it for just a minute, you'll see that what it did was the following. It said, because federal constitutional law is supreme, that no state is permitted to conclude in any law or to show in any law that there is something specially important about the male-female union, about procreation or procreative unions, and about linking children with the mother and father who made them. States may not take a position in favor of any of these points because the court held as a matter of constitutional interpretation. I mean, the, really the true fact is, this is not my opinion, it is just a fact. The, the Justice Kennedy's opinion is completely unrelated and unmoored from the Constitution. There's, it is made up. It is, you know, here's my opinion about liberty and I'm gonna call it a test for finding non-textual constitutional rights. That said, statement has been made, the law is made, that the Supreme Court said there are no important legal differences between same and opposite sex couples. There is nothing important to law, to the history of the US, to our freedom, to anything the Constitution cares about, about procreation or about children being linked with the mother and father who made them and knowing them and loving them and being known and loved by them. Oddly enough, Though the court had not affirmed the importance of the male-female relation in any opinion since 1965, the Griswold opinion, when finding a constitutional right to, um, for married couples to use contraception, the court waxed eloquently in Obergefell about the deep importance of the sexual relationship between same-sex couples. In Griswold, you may remember, it was the first opinion where we, Griswold was the basis for Roe. Griswold finds a right of contraception, not in the text of the Constitution, but in the, quote, penumbras and emanations of other rights. Then Eisenstadt, in 1972, says that this right of contraception extends to single people and uses language that says, you know, marriage is not a unity, marriage is two people, each of which has the constitutional right to decide about bearing or begetting the child. The woman gets to decide in row. Okay, so they were built on each other. But in Griswold, when the court talked about why the state of Connecticut could not have a law banning the buying and use of contraception. It did wax very eloquent about the importance of, the, of marital privacy and the, 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 the sacredness of the union between husband and wife for the purposes of saying that when they decide to use contraception, it's in the sacred privacy of this union. Not a word about <laughs> the sacredness or the importance or other things of the male-female union but in Obergefell, we get the court really waxing poetic. Ju Justice Scalia, after whom my law school is now named, um, refers to Justice Kennedy's opinions at times as cooing, <laughs> cooing um, uh, uh, over uh, the, the, the romance involved here. Um, in, in Obergefell, Justice Kennedy said, the enduring bond of marriage means the two persons together can find other freedoms. They find expression, intimacy, and spirituality. He said there was not, I love this, he said this in the Lawrence opinion, which made um, Lawrence in 2003 um, held um, homosexual sex to be a, a federal constitutional right. So it's not in the text of the Constitution, obviously. Justice Kennedy there said it was a federal constitutional right. And there he said, and quoted in Obergefell, surely, people having sex would only be I joke with my students that I call this the there is no one night stand in America provision of Justice Kennedy. <laughs> so he did that because he wanted to squeeze the right of 
um, non-procreative, non-marital sex into prior cases that gave families constitutional rights to decide about marriage, childbearing, et cetera. So by calling it an enduring relationship, he was able to squeeze the right of, of same-sex sex into the constitutional cases prior about family rights. And that's my guess as to why he did it. He concluded the uh, Obergefell opinion by saying, marriage responds to the universal fear that a lonely person might call out to find no one there. It offers the hope of companionship and understanding and assurance that while both still live, there will be someone to care for the other. So really romantic, um, but, but not about the male-female, okay? Just when you'd think that this would mark the low point, the low watermark of states retreat from an interest in male-female, we have a really interesting um, development this week. Just this week, the Senate in the state of Alabama is, uh, passed a law, we still have another house in House of Alabama, but I think the governor would sign it, that the state is abandoning marriage recognition entirely. That they are so resistant in Alabama to giving out uh, marriage licenses to same-sex couples, you know Roy Moore and all of the, um, the issue with uh, his refusal, uh, Alabama passing a religious freedom law that, uh, that said people didn't have to give these licenses out. Um, it could not bring itself to do that, and so they are, and it passed like on the day it was introduced, which was really interesting, um, that people can file an affidavit with the court and say, we're married, um, it's not incestuous, we're the right age, none of us is married before, we could just file it. So it's fascinating. I realize that it's not as if the state had been taking a real active role before, but, but from a legal perspective, for the state to be getting out of the marriage recognition business and saying it's a voluntary contract, I don't, however you did it, whatever, it's just give us a form that swears these three things and we'll just register it. That's a very stunning statement about what Obergefell has wrought in the way of reducing marriage um, to what is now not recognizable to us. Kennedy defines marriage in Obergefell as sex plus commitment. He calls it intimacy. Intimacy plus commitment is all there is uh, to marriage in his view. And so this is what's happened. Now it's true that there are some pieces of the law which support male-female unions. We have a federal marriage program that uh, is highly contested as to whether it's showing good enough results, but if you consider that Head Start hasn't shown any results really much for about 50 years and we're still trying new iterations of it, probably the marriage programs deserve more than a couple years try. And in fact, under the current administration, I understand HHS has asked for uh, $150 million to continue these programs, so to continue trying to improve these marriage programs. We have some state programs to support marriage at the state law level, but when budgets got tight, even states like Oklahoma, which had been a pioneer in this, retracted from that. Um, otherwise, you get some talk now and again about supporting marriage in um, uh, tax code, or at least not penalizing it. But again, now, when we talk about that, you know that that applies both to same sex and opposite sex. There is nothing special in the law about male-female. Now, allow me to summon the reasons I can think of why the law ought to pay special attention to the male-female relationship in marriage. A, men and women literally make society. They have to cooperate ordinarily as romantic partners to make future citizens. Assisted reproductive technologies are still, despite there being pretty growing 68K children born from reproductive technologies last year, uh, not that huge a fraction of birth. So if we want future society, and I won't go on but as to why, I can imagine you might have a few thoughts, then we would think men and women are valuable as a pair for that. Another reason to support their union would be to state the ridiculously obvious, which is that we need their cooperation to rear children. It's not just that the long-term cooperation of stable, low-conflict couple uh, is the gold standard for children. This is agreed by the right and left. But it's also because the state has not shown itself capable to managing huge hordes of children um, to healthy outcomes. 
One might also think it would be a good idea, at the very least, for the law to declare itself on the side of strong male-female relations for the same reasons that it cares to strengthen interfaith, or interracial, or international relations. To have peace between equal but diverse peoples produces good individual and social outcomes. It avoids social unrests, large protests, the cost of lawsuits, and maybe even violence. I mean, why do we promote excellent relations interracially, interculturally? It's, it's, a, it's, it's for social peace and the common good, and, and to, to realize an American ideal of equality and diversity. But we're not doing that here. And, the, and if the lofty good of peace doesn't convince, what about the good of the state not spending a lot of money <laughs> on the results of male-female division, okay? In order to try and close the gaps or repair the problems that flow from the falling apart or worse of male-female relations, the cost of divorce, non-marital births, violence, fatherless homes, child support collection efforts, which are massive, the state would be immeasurably better if this was done with private versus public dollars, okay? One hears various numbers on this, but a 2016 figure shows that 26% of people in families with children and married parents, only 26% fall below 150% of the federal poverty line, but over 60% of children and families with, with, uh, with unmarried um, parents fall below that. So why are these goods not enough to garner more support? These rationales really seem very solid on their face. Let me look at why I think they have not convinced. With respect to the good of the birth of children, we're near or a bit below replacement rate. In the words just this week of an official from the National Center for Health Statistics, quote, yes, it's below replacement level, but not dramatically. We have a high level of influx of immigrants, and it compensates for it. We are not having the kind of free fall in, in uh, birth rates like Denmark with its Do It For Denmark campaign. Have you seen it? Okay. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Do It For Denmark, and it's overtly sexual. Or Russia, take the day off and have sex. I mean, I think that's the official translation, okay? <laughs> Complete with prizes, monthly stipends, years of free diapers, and winning vacations if you get pregnant. So we're not in that position. You also have in the United States loud voices complaining that children are the natural enemy of the environment. I still think the first thing is the most thing. And we also have a desire among many not to have more poor children. And they're afraid if we start just thinking procreation is good in itself that we're going to get more poor children. And of course, Obergefell makes it official that states aren't permitted to value procreative coupling above non-procreative. What about the good of having men and women cooperate for a long time in order to rear children? We know it's the gold standard. Left and right know it. The marriage programs know it. The states, in interestingly, at divorce, more and more are moving to joint custody as the default position, that the children should stay in touch with mother and father. OK, good. But we also have unilateral no-fault divorce and very little effort to move towards slowing it down, longer waiting periods, making it tougher if you've got minor kids, very small, small movements in that direction. Since I think the, uh, some of the reasons why we don't focus on this good of marital parenthood, raising their children, is in part because since the overthrow of laws punishing illegitimate children, which used to be the phrase for non-marital births, since the overthrow of those laws on the rationale that why should children be punished for the actions of their fathers, since the Moynihan Report, which expressed a worry about the dramatic rise in non-marital births in the African-American uh, community in the 1960s, there is a backlash of suggesting that non-marital parenting could be problematic. It seems very judgmental. It seems particularly judgmental of the poor, and of the minority communities where the rates are very high. It seems unkind. I think also there is a belief that the state can help a lot. That if we just put more money or tweak the programs a bit more, I, I'm not dragging my book up to the podium because I don't have time to read you, but if you looked in the index of my book under the government programs, they start prenatally. And then they have at birth. 
and then they have, you know, at birth to six months, someone can come to your house, videotape mother-child reactions, talk back to you about how you are talking to your child this way or that way. Then we have early Head Start, then we have Head Start, then we have programs in school, we have after school, we have summer programs, special programs for incentivizing study and certain uh, uh, math and science during high school. We have after school programs then, we have summer job programs. We, I could go on. And there's just this thought that if we just did more of that or better. If you actually look, there's a couple of really great sources on this I would refer to you, you to. Su uh, Susan Mayer, who's an economist at U Chicago with a book called What Money Can't Buy, says, listen, we're doing an okay job with like food, clothing, and housing, but we're not making any headway in these other areas, education, job preparation. She says, it's, it's so tiny, it's almost not visible, okay? She's in favor of these programs, but just saying it's, it's not getting it done. In the words of Brookings scholar David Rybar, Brookings, as you know, is a, a think tank that considers itself on the left. Here's their summary of the governmental attempts to make up for the loss of a married parent. Quote, while interventions that raise incomes, increase parental time, provide at services, or other in-kind resources would surely benefit children, they are likely to be at best only partial substitutes for marriage. The advantages of marriage are the sum of many, many parts. This is Brookings, okay? Also operating against the state supporting the good of male and female parents rearing their kids together, I think is an allergy to the idea of sexual difference or complementarity. I worked on a conference for the Vatican very hard called Humanum, it was on male-female relations and complementarity. And I got back and I did an interview with this big reporter in the US and she starts the article with such and such a uh, conference was on complementarity, which is code for women second. <laughs> I didn't say that for the record. Um, complementarity, people are allergic to the idea of differences. It's so ironic, we're so in favor of diversity and equality everywhere except male, female. It's just fascinating. Uh, there's good science to show that there are advantages to complementarity in raising children, but people don't want to talk about it. Um, you may have seen this data by Raj Chetty from Harvard. He's sort of the, the, the guru on social mobility, talking about why it is that brothers and sisters raised in single parent homes, the boys are falling behind earlier and not catching up. And, and it, there's theorizing that this is linked to the fact that men are dramatically to to college now, and their, their jobs, uh, uh, the jobs of, of males raised in single parent homes are not catching up to their sisters, raised in the same home. Same health, same mother, same house, everything, natural controls. And the boys have fallen behind them. Peace between the sexes, well, because then there wouldn't be anything for certain politicians to talk about. <laughs> I'll just give you one example of this. Michael Weir, who was an evangelical who worked in the Obama White House, I think he worked all eight years. He tells the story in his book about working in the administration that there was a hot fight in the Oval Office about um, just caving on the contraception mandate because it was so controversial. And the head of Obama's reelection campaign says, oh, come on, this means you're for women and the Catholic bishops are not. This means you're for women and everyone else isn't. We gotta go with it. You gotta push hard on this. And they decided to do it, okay? Uh, the money that comes from political parties with agendas of pitting men and women, uh, that comes to political parties um, from feminist groups with an agenda to divide. I looked up, Emily's List gives $50 million almost per election cycle. It is, it is strictly for pro-abortion. Emily's List, early money is like yeast. Strictly to pro-abortion women. $50 million every election cycle, wow. Okay, the money and the political fodder to be made out of setting men against women. Um, and it's interest groups, but it's very much a part of our political bloodstream now. What about public versus private care? You would think this would be obvious. There is still, and you see it in the academic literature, but you also see it in the popular press, a suspicion of the marital family as a dangerous place, inherently sexist. It's called, uh, the words, I see these words every day, practically, in law review articles. The family is a hotbed of inequality. Just, it's just something. We can't go in and save every woman, so we just better say, don't enter into marriage. It's violent, okay? There's also strong political beliefs about the government's response to individual people that 
it's just good if the government takes care of this, that the family is just too uncertain a thing. It's better if a solid stream of federal funding takes care of it. There's also the idea that choice is just more important than this value. Individual choices are more important even than the stability and the, um, the, the, the cost effectiveness of married parents raising their own children. This goes hand in hand with arguments that your sexual choices are your identity. They are who you are. So that to criticize um, um, non-marital sex or a decision to have a non-marital child is like saying you are uh, a terrible person. Your identity is, I am opposed to your identity. So the obvious reasons for the law to care, I think, are overborne. Now, it's likely the law comforts itself by saying, oh, marriage will never go out of favor. People will always want to marry. They know that having kids during marriage is the standard. And you see these studies. Pew does them. Gallup does them. Young people want to get married. Young people want to have children. You ask women, rich or poor, do you think you'd like to have children during marriage or not? They say, oh, I'd like to have them during marriage. That would be better. But then you look at the data. Wealthy women are managing to pull this off, to marry more often and to have marital children. More and more and more, the poor are not. We also have this entrenched economic problem where it is very difficult to find enough employment for men so as to render them marriageable in the eyes of women who want to marry into a marriage with a man with a steady job. We have an epidemic of porn, which is putting women off those men and putting men off those women and marriage. We also have in dozens of countries, I was kind of shocked to see this, all of Scandinavia and even France and Chile, more than 50% out of wedlock births now. In France, when they invented the pact, the, the pact civil solidarité with the pact, it was meant to give same-sex couples something, a union, when they didn't have marriage. But 95%, now they have same-sex marriage, but even when they didn't, over 70% of pacts were by um, opposite sex couples who didn't want the full bond of marriage. They wanted an, e an easier out. Now, 95% of PACs are opposite sex couples, and there are two PACs for every three marriages. Two people are choosing a very marriage light in France. I think, with this sort of thing going on in the background, that our idea that, oh, well, people have always wanted to get married, people know marital childbearing is better for the children, it's really the more responsible decision. I'm stealing the words of Charles Taylor from his book, A Secular Age. We are living beyond our moral means. We do not have the, the, the community consensus anymore. Uh, we are living on the idea that what happened in the past will continue. We don't have the moral convictions, the reasoning, the understanding, the discipline to do what we say we think is good. We are living beyond our moral means. So just a few thoughts, and then I'm concluding here. We know why this, ma this matters for Christians in particular. I've just spelled out why it matters for everybody. But for us, if we take seriously <laughs> the New and Old Testament analogies between marriage and understanding who God is and how God loves and how we're supposed to love, if we take this seriously, then the loss of marriage means the loss of a vital understanding of a complete love of body and soul love. My favorite um, description of this is in a book by, I believe he's a Russian Orthodox theologian, Vladimir Solovyov, called The Meaning of Love, where he says, you know, when you fall in love and someone becomes your spouse, it might be the first time ever for you that you understand that someone else is at the center of the universe where you are. You know you're at the center of the universe. You know that, because you're, you're always looking out from these eyes, you know, this, uh, everything's around me. When you fall in love with a spouse, it is the time where you say, oh my gosh, this world, I, I don't really want to live in a world where I can't have you. You mean everything. I joke with my husband that when I have times where I treat him a little less than I should, I do, I'm plagued with these dreams, and I've had them like five times in, a, in an over 30-year marriage, the same exact dream, where I meet him, but I haven't married him. And I say to him, why does it seem like I'm just seeing you today and I haven't seen you in a while? And he goes, well, I haven't seen you since college. And then 
like I fall, I fall apart. I realize that my life is meaningless. If anyone's ever read Henry James' Beast in the Jungle, it's the realization at the end of that book. I realize I missed the thing. That's what I sense Vladimir Solovyov's getting around. And when, when, when Pope Francis gave the audiences on marriage before World Meeting of Families a couple years ago, he said, you know, I think part of the reason religion is declining is marriage is declining. And if you can't understand what it would be like to love like that and be loved like that, it's harder to understand the way God loves. And he says, and I think marriage is declining because religion is declining. And if we understood the good of that love, we would want to live that love as a community in marriage. So we know why this matters to Christians. Still, with all my, and I will end in about a minute and a half, two minutes here, I know I'm taking some time. I, I still have some hope um, because of the human person, our longing for relationship, our being built for such. Really, really important studies still show, even today, studies coming out of Harvard, studies coming out of Pew, Girls would like to date. Guys in college would actually like to date, too. <laughs> they would like to have meaning. For every article you see in the New York Times where a woman is celebrating um, absolute casual sex and just sort of flaunting that I like it as much as men, every other line is her desperation for that to turn into a relationship. <laughs> It is, it is shocking how this doesn't seem to be apparent to the writer <laughs> by the time she puts off her final line. Everything one sees in advertising, in movies, you see this, you know, have you noticed the sort of ads that come along at Christmas time? It's all about what people want family to be. The desire is there. You see research and when you ask people, who's your hero? Who's the person you want to be most like? Who's the person you rely on most? It's my mother, my sister, my father, my aunt, my grandmother vastly more than anyone else. Our notion of family lives and our understanding of its importance. What to do about it legally? The law is a kind of lousy, blunt instrument. It, it's doing all the wrong things. So I, I like to say, and I, I don't use this word in my book because it was published by Cambridge and I can't, but if I was going to say my first move would be first stop stupid. I mean, that's what, first stop undermining the male female. First, there's not a lot it can do to actually establish relations between us, but it can say how important they are. There's bully pulpit. There is messages about health that are related to being married. There's messages about health that are related to good dating. There's, re there's messages about health that are related to connecting sex, marriage, and children in the minds and lives of people. All of these things are perfectly within the government's purview. And don't tell me that this is not appropriate for government. The buses that pass you on the way here that talk about HIV AIDS and getting tested <laughs> and 1-800-Who's-Your-Daddy, privacy and sex is over in terms of public conversation. When the government speaks, it needs to be not against male-female, but in favor. Do I think that we could overturn a Burgerfell? Because we know that for 120 years prior, the Supreme Court recognize that male-female relations are of special value to the state? I'm not sure. I talk to a lot of my colleagues and they think that Roe would be overturned sooner than Obergefell. That the hue and cry is something that justices even would not be willing to suffer politically. There's all kinds of academic literature about justices' sensitivity to popular opinion. Um, just, just sort of a really unscientific anecdotal survey of colleagues. We don't think that's going. We, I, this is not the, the, I don't have the time and this is not the place to talk about all of the pastoral efforts we can make and all of your personal efforts in your own friendships, family, communities, parishes, schools, to, to understand and to rebuild the importance uniquely of the male-female relationship as a cooperative, positive, <laughs> mutually supportive relationship. I have, as Suzanne mentioned, these uh, a group that I formed, this is my last word, it's called Reconnect Media, Empower Local Voices, and it has two projects to try and put sex, marriage, and children back together in the minds and lives of Americans. I Believe in Love fosters stories from working poor Americans who are struggling to do this and require the law and culture and religion to support them. 
women speak for themselves is helping a lot of women who work in a whole variety of places, families. We have moms who homeschool, we have teachers, nurses, doctors, we have artists, dancers, everything, wherever they live, to empower them to, to correct the sexual marketplace that is so disturbed now and to rebuild relations between men and women. So I urge you to sign up for those and to look at that material for things that are more personal and more practical than I have time for here. I'm gonna stop, which you're so grateful for, I'm sure. Thank you so much, and I think Father wished me to take some questions, if you'd like. Thank you very much. So if I do questions here, am I ruining your um, recording? I'm not. Good. OK. Yes. Right. Um, yes. So um, probably, I'm going to say in advance, the way that I articulate it will make less set sense to people in your age cohort <coughs> because there is a sense of individualism, a sense of um, uh, uh, what is good is what I consent to. Um, there's a sense of subjectivism. So I will say a few things, but you may have replies to them that say, well, those aren't really values for us. Um, one of them is that they are fooling themselves if they think that there is nothing to be gained from um, exposing yourself to the third parties uh, who have expectations of you. Now what's ironic is they expose themselves to third parties who have expectations of them vis-a-vis -vis their appearance on social media, vis-a-vis -vis their political opinions. Vis -vis, and they maybe uh, take a lot of comfort or they suffer a lot of pain from the approval or disapproval of their friends. The people who are uh, experienced in marriage or any long-term commitment, people who have stuck with a company or have stuck with care for a sick child or stuck by a friend who's not so easy, will tell you that having a purely private vow is not nearly as effective as um, standing before some judging uh, entity that will help you hold you to it. And so, you know, one of the, um, you know, one of the reasons why non-marital parenting, you know, much as we admire the heroism of the woman who carries forth a child in a crisis pregnancy, who loves that child, uh, who gives her all to that child, um, the the fact that more and more and more of it happened, and people less and less and less often said, you really shouldn't do that to the child. I mean, one of the things about my book that I have a sort of caution that I say, listen, the government's going to continue talking about sex, and Republicans are totally going to be putting contraception out there. Let's just face it. I mean, George Bush Sr. was known fondly by his friends as Rubbers Bush for his enthusiasm for contracepting the third world. <laughs> okay, so, you know, just don't get the idea that, oh, you know, it's just the Democratic Party who is all behind this. But I would say that knowing that the government is going to do this, they could at least put out the caution that the decision you make at the moment of sex is the decision to create the child's family structure. You've just created it. And family structure is one of the most important matters for children. So what we say to people who say, well, I mean, it's going along far afield, let me bring it back, is you, you're fooling yourself if you don't believe that having external authorities hold you to your promise will not help you, strengthen you, get you through tough times. Um, and um, you may be one of those rare people, 
you know, that on New Year's Day makes a promise to go to the gym all the time and doesn't have a exercise buddy to kick your you-know-what out of bed at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, but it, it really does matter, and social support. So um, for me, so when I was uh, having kids and uh, uh, having kids and working, or when I was in my 40s and I, I had three kids, I was pregnant a couple times, miscarried, and I was about to have what I was pretty sure were going to be severely disabled children. To have people say, we'll be there for you, we'll help you for sure, you're doing a great thing, uh, yeah, it's, it matters. Um, and I guess, frankly, this is the nasty lawyer in me, just to be frank, I would flip it on them and say, what's your fear of telling other people and having other people support you in this? Um, you, the, the lady doth protest too much. It's just, a piece of, <laughs> it's just a piece of paper. And let me also say that that position is sometimes taken, I think, as a defensive position because it just is, and I'm not lambasting men here, I'm just saying the data on cohabitation shows that the woman is often the one who says, I think this could lead to marriage. In fact, I think it's going to. And the woman is the one who's saying, when is this going to lead to marriage? What's our timing here? Uh, why aren't we talking about marriage? So sometimes I think that that's a false consciousness from people who say it's just a piece of paper. I think they would like, most people would like nothing more than someone to say, I vow to be with you forever, and I make it in a responsible way such that I will be held accountable. I, that is not a soundbite, but I, I think uh, I think your a friend there doth protest too much about what he or she really wants. Uh, let me go over here, and then I'll come back over here. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so there's almost this cultural shift of we know that, you know, even if the parents were married, they didn't get along and that was different. Right. They grew up or they divorced. Um, and so there's a shift of like, well, then it's better to get married later so we don't make the same mistakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, That's really hard. So, you know, one of the things um, when the feds decided to get into marriage programs, people said, you're going to be fraud. I think the expression in the, uh, uh, well, who was the guy? Eduardo Porter. He writes sometimes in the New York Times. I forget what's his name. He said, they're going to be frog marching people down the altar, down to the <laughs> altar. No, they're so far from it. Because, and he says, and these people, they're gonna, they're, the reason they're not getting married is because they're not ready, they've had bad experiences, there's violence, there's whatever, and you're going to be piecing, you're going to be piecing together couples who don't belong together. So here's the thing, if you actually look at uh, happiness and divorce rates in marriage, the sweet spots, um, I can't remember the exact beginning, I think it's like 23 or 25, it's like from 25 to 32, like I'm just, this is not, this is on average, nobody panic, you know what I mean? <laughs> I have people say like, my mother married at 19 and they were very happy, was it a mistake? You know, no, it was great, you know. But, but in terms of sweet spots, um, uh, and for several very practical reasons, um, men who have more premarital sexual experience generally than women, if they go through too many cohorts of women, oh, first they go through the 19 to 21, then the 23 to 25, then the 25 to 29, they're getting less and less marriage ready <laughs> all the time. So the, the longer and longer, if it's combined, so obviously there's a million factors. If it's combined with you know, premarital sex, with cohabitation, then your rates of divorce really will start to go up and up uh, if you wait. Um, on the other hand, for people who don't marry under 20, probably good, right? On average. On average, these are just some of the figures that you see in the research of uh, Brad Wilcox at University of Virginia. And um, um, so, it's good not to be too young, but the idea that that every month or year adds more wisdom and increases the likelihood. There's actually, you know, if it is combined with cohabitation and testing partners, if it's combined with premarital sexual partners, if it's combined with a variety of things, no. Um, and so the, the age thing has those kinds of caveats attached to it, OK? Back over here, I'm going to say further in the back. Yes, Father? Yeah, 
Yeah, so um, they, there's, there's several unknowns here. One is, does that mean that officials in Alabama, like, are not going to be doing marrying anymore. No, if you can get, I mean, and some states have reduced it to like a notary public, which I think, I, I have even an extended family and I've heard of people who get a friend to be a notary public and then that friend officiates at the wedding. You know, there is something about a little bit of ceremony, a little bit of before and after understanding. I get, I'm not, you know, dogmatic about this, I'm just saying, commonsensically speaking on this, that to have, you know, your friend who, you know, you remember, you know, being goofy with you in seventh grade, uh, performing your marriage ceremony may not impress its seriousness upon you. And you know that that also is not going to be presaged by premarital preparation, you know, personality inventories, counseling, dealing with the major issues that come up with marriage. So, if Alabama is getting out of it, are they still going to allow certain state officials to marry people, but no need for a license? Uh, are they going to have state officials get out of the business entirely? Which would seem to me, you know, they don't need to if their main objection is we don't want to do same-sex marriages. Uh, it means that, um, uh, you know, if the state got out of the business, then that would mean that people would have to find a religious officiant to do that. Well, that's not going to be hard if you can find Unitarian, uh, Episcopalian, you know, some versions of Lutheran, etc. It's not going to be hard. And it'll be a little harder to find that in some towns than others, some states than others. One of the caveats that I saw in the bill is they're not going to be getting out of the business of divorcing, child custody, spousal support, child support, etc. So, um, that's kind of interesting because without getting into the boring details of family law, in the U.S., we don't have at the state or federal level these flowery statements of what marriage is. Marriage is, in France and Germany, you have codes that marriage is a partnership of the whole of life. Or that. We don't have that. We actually make statements about what marriage is by what we don't allow it to be. You can't have two. You can't be so young, you can't decide, so you have to have mental capacity. It, it's, uh, it's not between uh, people who are too close uh, with consanguineous relationships. But really, our major statements about what marriage is is that divorce, where we say, oh, well, you promised that you would take care of each other forever, so marriage is supposed to be forever because now it's not, and you know your wife didn't work for 30 years, and now you owe her spousal support for the rest of her life. Very rare, but it happens. Um, so marriage must have, oh, we must have meant by marriage a promise for mutual support forever. We know by what we do at the divorce. Um, uh, we're not, we're giving you less property because you spent money like a crazy person every month you were married. Oh, marriage was supposed to be more of a equal sharing and responsible handling of property. Oh, why didn't you say that up front? You know what I mean? <laughs> no, we, we tell you at the back end by giving you very little because you blew it. So, um, interestingly, and I'm thinking about this very theoretically, I, I will write about this till the cows come home if Alabama does it, is they're not getting out of the stating about what marriage is, because when they do divorces, they'll be making these sort of statements about it. But they, but, but, but then taking it again back to the perspective of the talk, I mean, states used to care that the quality of a marriage is the quality of this household, is the quality of this neighborhood, is going to be the quality of these schools because parents care about the next generation. We know married people vote more. We know that they give more money to charity. They volunteer more. We know that they care about the future a lot because they have these kids, right? And they're, the, they're helicopter parents, and we love that in, in the good ways. Um, so you really are going to have, with the state saying, eh, I mean, when the Supreme Court said no to polygamy in the Reynolds decision in the 1870s, they said one of the reasons why we're not doing polygamy is because what happens in a family is reflected in a community. And if we have men ruling these sort of small villages of women, <laughs> then the patriarchal principle will also be carried into the larger society, and that's bad. Isn't that fascinating? We're an 1870s court. So, 
all these and then from then to 1980s, all these statements of the Supreme Court about you know marriage sets the tone, and um, we know from Raj Chetty's surveys that if you move poor kids from single parent homes into neighborhoods with more married parents, that whether it's a rich or poor neighborhood, the kids just do better being around more sort of just a little orderly. There's a little bit more, there's a little less chaos, there's a little bit more uh, covering of one another, and those kids do better because the neighborhoods have an effect on them. And the earlier you move them in, the better they do. So um, uh, it's very, very interesting that the state is just saying, go get, go get somebody to marry you and just let us know. Again, maybe you know, it's not going to be a huge leap, but it's a huge historical statement from where we were. Okay. Yes? Uh, this morning I watched a video put out by the BBC um, talking, tracking uh, two men and one woman who, were going, who had a child um, and were going to raise the child. Okay. Um, and the video talked about kind of the, the end goal of hopefully Denmark is heading in the direction of allowing this as an actual <laughs> marital union. Apparently, some territories or provinces are not in Canada already allow this, which I was not aware of. Um, obviously, I'm not sure if they allow it so much as they will allow government benefits to go to each of them as spouses. If Britain does that too, they could they can have a man. They won't allow it to happen there, but if you come in and you bring in a group, you can get a benefit as husband and wives under the, uh, the state welfare system. So it's, it's, there's different ways the law might recognize. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, um, so looking at this, you just mentioned polygamy, but what about this kind of I polyamorous, I guess it would be called, yeah. um, approach? Obviously, from a Christian perspective, there's all sorts of things that are wrong. Mm -hmm, um, but, but when looking at it from kind of a practical level, yeah. level or legal perspective. Right, um, it's um, such an interesting right. question. Um, again, my unscientific anecdotal survey of other law professors, and my own opinion in this case meshes. When Justice Kennedy made up same-sex marriage as a constitutional right, um, one of the things he kept saying was two, 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 just gratuitously threw the number two in there. Um, once you've said that 120 years of cases that talk about man, woman, and the cases say the state's interested in marriage, we're not interested in your romance, we're interested in you taking care of, having and taking care of kids. We're interested in you making society and rearing it. And then all of a sudden we're not interested in any of that. So he ignored all that, but he kept throwing in two, marriages, two, two this, two this, two this. And Justice Scalia said, of course, you're just, you made that up too. You're just, you're, you're playing with us. <laughs> you're trying to get us to think that you're not going to go further. Um, the polygamous laws under the First Amendment, polygamous, polyamorous, lost under the First Amendment um, in 1870s because they said anti-polygamy laws predated freedom of religion in the Constitution. They lost after Casey when the Casey Court in 1992 said constitutional rights are rights to shape your own universe and your identity. You remember the ah, sweet mystery of life? The, I just call it the wacko passage out of Casey. <laughs> it's just the constitutional rights are anything that you need to shape your universe. You know, obviously not. So I mean, when the people the right to die folks came up to the Supreme Court and said, my universe is totally shaped by deciding when I'm going to die. I mean, obviously, they should have won if the court meant what it said, but they lost two cases, uh, Glucksburg and Vaco versus Quayle in the late 90s. I think that the Supreme Court will not make polygamy a constitutional right for only one reason, so as not to call Obergefell into question as legit. I don't, th I think obviously polygamy is constitutional if same-sex marriage is constitutional, if abortion is constitutional, if, I mean, if, if um, non-procreative, consensual, non-marital sex is constitutional, they're all constitutional rights. Obviously, polygamy would fit under that. And the, I think the only reason you won't see it as a constitutional right is uh, because they want to say, they want to make Obergefell seem like it's actual law, like, it, like, it's, like it's reasonable. I say that in a technical form. I mean, you know, for anybody here who's a lawyer, when the Supreme Court finds substantive due process that is non-textual constitutional rights, there is a formula. 
And they're supposed to follow it. And Justice Kennedy, first he altered it in Lawrence, and he said, you don't look at the history and tradition of the country for rights that we all assume. You look at what Europe's doing, and you look at the last 50 years of laws, and you look at what people are thinking from polls. Then he gets to Obergefell and he says, let's not look at the last 50 years, because in the last like five years, 36 states have banned same-sex marriage. So that's not the test anymore. Let's look at what I think liberty is, OK? <laughs> and I'm not kidding. New concepts of liberty in my head. And I, what, I think it's almost comical that there are no concurring opinions in Obergefell. It's almost like the other four justices are going, please forget we're here. We are a vote, <laughs> but we didn't actually write this opinion. Like, please? I mean, Justice Kagan is just way too brilliant, OK? I mean, her writing is really amazing. She could never have said things the way Kennedy said it there. So I know, again, I go far afield. However, individual states, California and some others, will probably be approving parental identification for three or four or five or more parents. I would not be the least surprised. So parentage laws. I think we'll be the first to go. Um, but I, th and I think uh, individual states, California and others, <laughs> will um, allow marriage among groups eventually. But it won't be a constitutional right forced on all the states so as to make Obergefell look legit, in my view. Yeah. Uh, maybe one last question just for all of your time, right here. Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> you should have a talk show. That's a <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's a does he? Oh, that's great. No, that's a great. Um, that's really interesting. What would I want it to be? So, um, oh God. Since you know, I I teach straight law, but my I love also you know theology. And um, I love philosophy, even though I'm really untutored. I have two kids, well, one with a U Chicago philosophy degree and another one about to get one. <laughs> uh, my other kid's an artist, so I don't know whatever he's talking about. <laughs> it's really good, but I don't understand. But the other two, I have no, leg I have no cred there, but I love it. Uh, I would want to explore in the 21st century, and I, and I go back to this young lady's first question, in, in, in connection with the values held by the millennial, in connection, I would want to explore your understanding of a liberal society, your understanding of equality, your understanding of freedom. And I would want to um, get that down. I would want to do compare and contrast with other uh, versions of it so that you could um, uh, you could see what you liked, and, and maybe yours are not the, the best, or some of them are good, some of them aren't. Um, and so I, by distinction, you know, to understand that, and then apply those to the family in law and in theology. So it, it, that's what, but I, I think that the, the shift that I have described in law is just, it's, it's in a constant interplay with the shift in culture. I say to my students sometimes, OK, this case is only 30 years old, but I know it seems to you like it's 200 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, There's a case about the importance of fathers and the importance of a father marrying the mother of the child. And the law is going to give a favor to the man who marries the mother, not to the man who has a child and goes elsewhere. Well, now the bottom line is, because you pay child support, oh, you are God. OK, that is so cool. I, are you married or not? OK, don't even answer it. It doesn't matter. Are you paying child support? That is so fabulous. I mean, the, the, that case is only like 30 years old. But it seems hundreds of years old to say the marital father has stepped up. He has, he has joined with the mother in a way that helps the child to understand that there's something special about what he's done. I think the bridge between our understanding of freedom, equality, happiness, et cetera, is so great right now that we have to lay out what those ideas are and even just introduce competing interpretations in order to even understand what the data says would be good about family, let alone what Christianity is recommending now. So that would be 
uh, a combination of what would be philosophy, theology, law. There's a journal at Catholic U used to have law, philosophy, and theology, but introduced from law, philosophy, and culture. I think they're trying to revive it. And it would be the, it would, every day would be like the kind of pieces in that journal. <laughs> okay, I think we should stop for time. Thank you so much for your uh, coming and attention. <laughs>